here to introduce our next uh, two speakers before lunch. And uh, I'm, I'm very pleased uh, that Rebecca has been able to join us this time. Uh, she, uh, her, her talk and her project, what she's doing, are in uh, the 2% book that I wrote. Uh, so you can read some more about it there if you want. I, I, I met Rebecca at, at EcoFarm, which is a conference, a big organic uh, ecological farming conference in California in, in January of the year. I actually met a couple times. I was extremely impressed by uh, the work that she uh, is doing, was doing at the time, and is still continuing. Uh, it's, it's something that I hadn't really thought about. I think many folks here uh, don't think about, when we think about sustainability, we think about water, we think about food, those kinds of things. Uh, we had thought about our clothes, the clothes that we wear. Where do they come from? How are they produced? Are they drenched in fossil fuels? Those kinds of things. And so, uh, when Rebecca spoke for the first time, when I heard her, it was really inspiring, and her work has continued. She's a native California, fifth generation in the, in the Bay Area. Uh, is walking the talk, as you'll hear, about uh, sustainable regenerative organic clothing. And with no further ado, let's, let's welcome Rebecca Burgess up. a great pleasure to be at Quivera Coalition meetings like this. I've been hearing about this gathering for years from colleagues in California, like Dr. Jeff Creek, and people at the Rent Carbon Project that I work with. And I've always felt like, when do I get to go? And I get to come, and then I, I'm speaking too. OK, I just wanted to come and hang out. But <laughs> it's, such, it's just lovely to see you all. And um, I can't wait to. Um, gather in small groups and confer with you um, at different levels about this work and what you're doing. So based on um, the last presentation, I just needed to get to know you all a little bit since it's my first time here, just to clarify our value set. Um, how many of you love industrial scale feedlots and CAFOs? <laughs> One? Kind of? No. All right. How many of you love glyphosate and Roundup Ready crops? Okay. How many of you love the flagrant use of fossil carbon to transport food long distances? All right, that's wonderful. So um, we're all on the same plane there. And now I'd like you to look down at what you're wearing. And I'd like you to raise your hand if you have considered mileage related to your garment, the use of glyphosate and Roundup Ready crops, or have you looked at grass-fed and finished? The value sets you're applying to the food you're ingesting and that which you purchase weekly, have any of you put that value set into the clothing that you wear on the largest organ of your body, your skin? One, two, three. Okay, we need to improve these numbers. <laughs> But these same systems that are feeding you are clothing you. And if you are not looking at pasture or rangeland as a source for your fiber, and if you are not looking at arable land as a source for your fiber, you are directly wearing fossil carbon extracted from the lithosphere. You're wearing acrylic, nylon, polyesters. So literally, if it's not from fossil carbon sources, it's from biosphere-based sources. And it's from biosphere-based sources, it has to come from our land. And it has to come from those same animals and plants that are feeding you. So the work that I do was galvanized by asking myself those same questions. And it was also galvanized by the fact that, um, just to riff off of um, the last presentation as well, I spent 10 years working with children with autism who were nonverbal. And so I learned a lot about neurology and how to move people from where they are to where they want to be through looking at the nervous system and how we adapt as human beings to new information and how we integrate new information. So looking at the autistic spectrum, we are all actually on it in some form, <laughs> but we have children who are in the extreme form who we pathologize. And so, when I started to understand and de deconstruct the sources for some of the autism jump in my community as a teacher, I started to see it was going up 400 times um, since the 1970s, based in the early 2000s. And I saw children who 
um, whose methyl pathways were compromised, and so any extra toxicity in the system, in their environment, could throw them into oppositional defiant disorder, could throw them into a set of other pathologies, just being exposed to small amounts of toxins. Because when you're already in the autism spectrum and your methyl pathways are already compromised, you cannot wear synthetic clothing many times. You cannot wear synthetic dyes. You cannot wear endocrine disrupting agents. You have no more capacity or threshold to take on toxins. And so when I worked with these children, I realized that they did better in school when they actually were exposed to less toxins. The cleaning agents we used in the schools we had to change. That which they wore had to change. That which they ate had to change. Just so we could have basic functioning. And we did get nonverbal children to start speaking. But we had to do this through changing environmental exposure to toxins. So that's another place in which I enter the conversation. I'm also a weaver. I went to UC Davis. I studied nature and culture. Um, so a little bit of a renaissance person, but the applications weave together. Um, and so this work that I'm doing um, is really focused on what you see in this slide, which is my fiber shed. Um, I studied ethnoecology with Kat Anderson at UC Davis and some of the Wintu and Patwin and Ohlone and Coast Miwok tribes that I worked with helped me understand how important the locale is for our understanding of place, how material culture used to be within strategic geographies, how we grew, how we sourced our medicine, our toys, our pharmacy, everything was in a shed. And those sheds created a responsibility to place. When things were, when anonymity came with industrial revolution and those large supply chains, so did a series of consequences. And to quote Courtney, the age of consequences is what we face. And I think a lot of it has to do with a lack of intimacy with where these things come from. So as we regain intimacy with place, as we regain an intimacy with the land, we all of a sudden start realizing how we can nourish our bodies, our minds, and our hearts through these community connections. And so fiber shed is cultural, it's scientific, um, but it's also a shed. It's like a watershed or a food shed, but it's your fiber shed. So I'd ask all of us to consider what our existing fiber shed is. Is your existing fiber shed Bangladesh, the Rana Plaza factory? Was it Southeast Asia? Is it part of the 52% of the textiles in the world that come from China? Are we offsetting the ecological costs to other countries? Yes. So how do we bring those costs and internalize them and bring them home while making our own homelands more beautiful, more connected? That is what Fiber Shed ultimately is about. And so I didn't learn how to change slides yet. So. <laughs> and fundamentally, with a Fiber Shed system, I feel like we have to break it down at this time with climate change bearing down and the changes already upon us, we cannot rebuild local systems without using carbon as an organizing principle. The complex carbon molecules that form your body and that form every living thing are something that we are often taking for granted, but they are exactly why we live or die. So, and all the species that we share this planet with. So I think of how do you organize for carbon? And there's many ways to do that, from how you're managing your rangeland, for how, how long the distances, travel distances are, for how goods and services are transported into your community. But this is how I organize, and I start with carbon, and then I build out of that. So just to refrain on why a fiber shed is important, fossil carbon is the source for all the color that you're wearing, unless you know you are wearing a plant-based color. So as we divest from fossil fuels, we will be divesting from color as you know it. Color was invented in 1870. Synthetic compounds for color were invented in 1876 by William Perkins as 400 pounds of coal tar to make one ounce of blue dye. That ratio has shifted, but the colors you're wearing are still from lithosphere-based carbon today, MLN fiber reactive and all synthetic dyes. The toxic load in the factory or on the farm Heavy metals are used in the dyes as well, cadmium, lead, and mercury. The endocrine disrupting agents that we're now starting to learn about, like alkaphenols and MPEs, these are in the dyes and the finishing agents. There's 2,000 synthetic finishing agents that are put onto the clothes before they arrive in different forms just to make them wrinkle-free or 
have them arrive so you can put them on a hanger and there's nothing really wrong with them. We, we coat things with polyvinyl acrylics. Um, even our natural fibers are often coated. Smart wool is coated um, with an acrylic. So carcinogens, um, these are also part of the textile industry. And these are very unregulated as it stands because this industry has been offshored. And Germany last month actually outlawed endocrine disrupting agents from being applied to clothing that were being imported to the country. And I would say we should have laws where we don't import clothing that counteracts our own labor standards or our own environmental standards. If we don't allow it in our country, we shouldn't be importing it from countries that do. So that would be my addition to the trade laws if we were actually adopting ones that served the people. So additionally, on the farm, we also need to consider the use of glyphosate, Roundup Ready crops, aldicarb, um, methylophion. There, these are things like, for instance, I believe it's aldicarb, that if your skin makes contact with a quarter size of it in your palm, it's known to even cause death upon skin contact. Hazmat suits are used to, to apply it. And it ends up on the cotton that is then ginned, spun, knit, and lands up in the department store or at your doorstep in a FedEx box after you ordered it from your favorite clothing company. It's what we need to remind ourselves of. If you didn't want your children working in the cotton fields, you don't want other people's children working in these cotton fields. A million children are working in the cotton fields in Egypt today. 100,000 children are working in the cotton fields in Pradesh, India. And we know about the Rana Plaza factory where um, around more than 1,000 people died when they were rushing to create an order for Western companies, and they let women and men back in the building even they, when they knew it wasn't safe, and it collapsed on them as they were sewing. Um, the waste, the other thing about this is that as we go to fiber shed based systems, we are gonna have to reduce consumption because we don't need even what we're buying. We're throwing away up to 70 pounds of textile waste per year. It's flooding indigenous communities overseas and supplanting their own abilities to make clothing for themselves because they get flooded with our waste, free waste. <laughs> so their own textile cultures are debilitated by our waste. 10% of what we throw away ends up sold at a goodwill. 90% is landfill or offshore. So this is a fiber shed. So for one year, I thought, well, I'll dress myself in my own, from my own community's fiber and see how this could work. And in the center, in the Bay Area, all the little dots you see have a key. That's either a designer, a knitter, a weaver, a spinner. These are people who've been on the landscape and the economy has forced them into kind of a hobbyist role in many cases. We don't actually have an industry that supports people to have full livelihoods in the sector. But if you look in the urban areas of Berkeley, Oakland, San Francisco, you see all this design talent pouring out of our design schools, CCA, San Francisco School of Design. Young people, graduates, every year with all the skills to make the clothing. All the while, we have farms surrounding the Bay Area that aren't even using the fiber that they're raising. So I started to connect um, the urban and the rural to help me dress myself. And so Fibershed's mission has become based off of my own experience. Um, we establish relationships and we build networks of farmers and makers, and I'll show you examples of that first. That's how I'm going to go through this presentation. The next thing I'll do is I'll show you some of the public education and skills training that we're doing. And then lastly, I'll talk about how we design and organize and actually develop fiber systems. So this was 2012. Since then, this is the amount of farmers we now have as paid members within 150 miles of our headquarters in San Geronimo, California. These are farmers and ranchers who are focused now on fiber production or they raise for meat and they don't have a place for their fiber to go if they're in the sheep industry in particular. So if you look, I used to connect, all those designers in the urban area were connected to each of those farms. All of my 20 garments that I wore for a year were relationships between the urban and the rural. Now we have all of these farmers and now I feel very obliged to help all these farmers show how their fiber can be expressed in clothing. Because part of the work is showing that it's real. How do you wear it? How do you show a living prototype of an expression of a landscape that is soil to skin from your home? So now we have all these farmers, 
And the truth of the matter is I'm feeling a little bit like I have a glut of fiber. And the reason is because in my fiber shed, we throw away 1.5 million pounds of wool. Or it's composted, and that's a good thing. Um, and, or it's sent into the commodity market and sent overseas for other workers to add value. We process less than three-tenths of 1% of our material. California is producing over 3 million pounds of wool per year, but no Californians are wearing wool from California. Except now, we are starting to see a very small seed planted to offer an alternative to that waste. And that's by building very simple relationships with young people and old people, urban and rural. The woman on the left is on Utopia Ranch in Mendocino. She's 100 years old, and she raises merino sheep in Mendocino County. Jean Muir attributes her health to Tai Chi. <laughs> she's an ex-school principal, but she's a rancher. She runs 56 head of sheep. It's small, but um, you know she's doing it on her own. On the right is Allison uh, Riley, who is now um, so inspired by the project. She started this project when she was 18. So we had 18 years old and 100. And they came together and they made a sweater from a sheep named Daisy. <laughs> Daisy is a U who was 15, a very old U. And that sweater was dyed in Heteromelies arbutifolia, which is a native California chaparral species that's co-evolved with herbivory. So I go out and I prune, kind of like the deer eat and then I make dyes out of those native chaparral species. And that sweater I called the spring sweater, and I wore it farming indigo that whole year, because wool is not just a winter fiber. Sheep wear wool in the summer, and we can too. And so one of the things I've noticed about these relationships, here's a more complex relationship. I started, most of these relationships were built um, with wool, very simply. One designer, one rancher one prototype. Here's a more complex relationship. We also are supplying the world with 200 million pounds of cotton in California. Less than 1% of it is organic. There's one bio, she's going to be certified biodynamic this year. She is certified organic. She grows color cotton. Cotton is not just white. She grows green cotton and brown cotton and sea island cottons. Cotton is a tropical perennial, um, but we treat it like an annual. And Sally Fox is on the far right, wearing her own cotton um, and a piece that she actually designed. I'm in the center um, for indigo. I grew the indigo for this project I'm about to describe. And then Leslie Terzian is a Bayview Hunters Point weaver in San Francisco who has 30 years of weaving experience. And then on the left, Dan DeSanto, who is a veteran of Levi Strauss. So we popularized denim in my community. So I thought, what better prototype development project than to revision denim? Because I live in near San Francisco. I live in the home base of Levi Strauss, so let's re-narrate. So this is the small team that came together to do some research. And the research is fully undone, I will say, but we do have, oops, sorry. I just want to show you, that's Sally and her fields. Sally is very interested in what I'll speak about soon, which is carbon farming. She's very interested in the work. She's right now organic and biodynamic, but she runs sheep through her cotton stubble. She raises about 150 merino sheep on 165 acres. She rotates Sonoran wheat with her cotton. She grows a winter wheat. And then she co-plants black-eyed peas with her cotton as a nitrogen fixer. And milo and teff are grains that she co-plants with the cotton. So she has a grain that she'll get for food. So she's a food and fiber farmer, all on this 165 acres. And she's very interested in sequestering atmospheric carbon. I don't normally wear that in a field, but I'm just going to say that that's the indigo field it's for a magazine shoot. But that's a certified organic farm. I didn't have a choice. I really wanted, I'm really wanting to pilot no-till indigo, but I, you know, just getting the indigo to California was enough. 10 years of seed saving and building up my seed bank. Um, this was my first year of scaling the indigo because you need 440 pounds of dried leaf to actually compost it, to get the thermophilic bacteria to break down your indigo. This is me doing biosphere-based blue. I'm wearing the indigo and that's the plant. Um, and I'm wearing Sally's cotton as well in that picture. This is the indigo flowering. This is the first California indigo project um, at scale in our history. 
So Leslie is very sweet. She wove this cotton from Sally, went from Sally to me to Leslie. She wove, if you're a weaver, 64 ends per inch, very dense. And then it went to Dan in the East Bay, and he customized patterns for every wearer, and we started what we call the first denim CSA. Just to get it out of there. <laughs> but I think we made a beautiful first stab at this. And here's a pair of the jeans, and that top is a grass-fed top. And it's a grass-fed top dyed in pokeberry, which is a toxic plant, and we harvest all the berries. It's toxic to livestock. We harvest all the berries, and we um, make dye out of that, cold water fermented dye. And the jeans were dyed, those, that blue, I should say, is all dyed at 68 degrees, and all of the vat is fermented. All I use is bacteria as my friends. And the bacteria is what helps me make indigo. I don't use heat. I don't use inputs. I use heat from thermophilic bacteria, but I don't add in fossil carbon heat. It's a very beautiful process to work with nature. Just use time as your tool. So we had an event, because we could only offer 20 pairs of denim <laughs> in our first run. <laughs> but don't worry, it will scale, I have no doubt. But so we had an event at one of our producers' farms. And I don't know if you can see on the far right, we had hand-painted signs by um, young people from the Agrarian Land Trust, um, some of Severin von Fleming's friends helped us paint, wear fresh carbon, not fossilized. You know, wear, this is fresh, this is from the biosphere, wear this instead of the fossil carbon. And build soil, ameliorate climate change through that which you wear. And um, this was a, a 270 person event on October 3rd of this year. We celebrated the plants and had botanic drawings of Giuseppium barbadens and Polygonum tinctorium. Those are the, those were only two ingredients in our sunlight, rainfall, bacteria, cotton, and indigo. Though that's the genes. They're compostable, 100% compostable genes once you take off the button fly. <laughs> so Patagonia came to the event and they filmed it. Um, we do, we are starting to work with brands, I'll get into that more. We've worked with Patagonia quite a bit. Their filmmakers are on the left, pounding indigo leaves. Sh we're showing people how the blue translates into fiber. They had an impromptu kind of music pounding session. Um, we make sure at each event that we are honoring the food and the fiber equally. So Guido Frazzini from True Grass Farm, grass fed and finished beef on a family ranch from 1867. He's like, I think 32 years old running. He got Cattlemen's, I think, Environmental Steward of the Word um, last year. Guido came with half a side of beef and he grilled it right there and he made these amazing, um, he, we ate the heart, we ate everything. And he, he served this um, to everyone to show like what it means to use the whole animal and what local food systems need to do to use the whole animal. Um, in their process. We hyper-localized all of the food within five miles, certified organic. So people were just dripping in this amazing abundance of what we could feed ourselves with, what we could clothe ourselves with. It's so important that when we educate our communities that we're integrated in how we're educating. The sensory experience is how you integrate all of your learning. You have these senses and you are going to integrate all the systems thinking that we need to bring back to the human race is going to happen through sensory rich experiences. It doesn't just happen through hearing, it happens through smelling and eating and touching. And so these educational moments are about how do you, you know, we feed you, we educate you, and we show you how to spin cotton. <laughs> and then we remind you that what you are wearing is carbon and water. The jeans that I'm wearing are just carbohydrates. What you ate and what you wear was carbon and water. So tying people and their fiber shed back to the carbon cycle. And then the grass-fed piece, my personal favorite. <laughs> I really appreciate how many grass-fed tops we were able to make this year. This piece, this is a grass-fed top made with cashmere, mohair, merino, and angora, a rabbit couple of goats, some sheep, all spun together by one hand spinner and then one designer knitter. So at this event, we made sure people knew that the jeans might be carbohydrates, but the tops you're wearing are grass-fed. And these are all the farms we're going to bring together. The language of the landscape is expressed through one item of clothing that you can see and touch and smell. 
So at the uh, Wool Symposium last week that we had, we had the teams of people. That's the people. Those are the people who made that talk. And they actually get the farmers and designers up and they talk to a group of another 250 people. We have a whole other event to break down and deconstruct what we did to tell the community how the clothes are made. So the clothes aren't just made in the back room of a studio in San Francisco. The people who made them engage with the community. This is the connectivity that's required for this scale of education. Um, let's see. So in 2015, we felt very good about incorporating 81 fiber producers, spinners, designers, that we engaged in prototype production for carbohydrate and grass-fed clothing just for one event. Um, so we really wanted to build community while showing people what's possible while stacking the functions of educating the public. Um, and just so you know, our, our events are very diverse. So the Central Valley in California is culturally very conservative compared to the coast, you all know this. But we bring, a lot of our producers are from the Central Valley, and we have a lot of wonderful, mature male ranchers who come to our wool symposium, as well as yeah. some people who live in Molinas and Holy Grace. <laughs> so just so you know, they were about five feet from each other. <laughs> and those are the natural dyers. You know, so we all collaborate. And then we also invited kind of the very well-to-do upper crust San Francisco mom who wants to learn how to weave. So we all, we're trying to bring everyone to the table. This doesn't, it's not about where you come from, it's where you're going. And how do we codify this work? So we know that economic development is key to this. And so this year, last week, we, we created an entire book um, and it's a living document. It's going to increase in scale. I wish I could just pass it around. We have about 40 of our farmers and ranchers uh, monumentally documented in this piece, this box. And it's a tactile perspective of the land box. And you open it, and each page has a sample of the wool from the ranch in a raw fiber form and the knitted material. So designers from brands and designers who have small and medium scale companies were making these books to send out to them. And all of our farmers and ranchers' content information. Are you grass-fed and finished? Do you, are you certified organic? Are you working on a carbon farm plan? What's your you know, micron count? All of the data about land management, plus all the tactile realities of the fiber are expressed on one page, plus very nice pictures of the people. Wow. We're going to keep documenting until we've mapped every rancher every farmer, and we're giving this to all of the design companies and all the brands. We want to see this local fiber out, and we can't just do it through prototype development. We need a huge groundswell of makers and brands and supply chains to take this on. And the wool book is one tool, and we keep refining. It's not the single tool, but I think it's a good one. <laughs> and we've seen this year rancher businesses. Eight new businesses have started just in our little 150 miles with ranchers starting to use the grass-fed fiber and using plants from the ranch and dyeing them so that all the color and form comes from one land base and they're starting new yarn lines. We don't have advanced supply chains like the Chinese do or the Eastern Europeans in this country. We have a lot of textile uh, manufacturing in the southeast of the country, but we are still pretty much without a fine gauge wool mill. We have one wool mill near UC Davis and a handful of small wool mills in California that can produce yarn for hand knitters. You need much finer gauges to wear the kind of clothing that you're wearing. The kind of clothing that you would wear like Smart Wool or um, Rambler's Way, that's a $26 million wool mill. So we can't just jump into those capital investments without proving demand. How do you prove demand? You go with the low-hanging fruit. The low-hanging fruit is use the mill you've got, Use the wool you've got, use the plants you've got, start building businesses and build your demand analysis around the small businesses that are succeeding. This rancher was not using a lick of her fiber. Her wool was a little bit too rough, so she brought some alpaca to the ranch, and then she just started blending the alpaca and the wool together, sent it off to the mill. She dyes it on the ranch um, with some helpers, and now her yarn, I mean, I'm all about regional, but her yarn's now in Tokyo and <laughs> in Seattle. I mean, she's become world famous, and, and, and that's a great consequence. Um, and she's selling a lot of wool locally in our community. The other way to make sure that we codify this work 
is through telling stories online. And 2015, we went to all the new ranchers and farmers in, the, in our producer program, and I sent young people who are young journalists from San Francisco in their early 20s. I trained them in how to do the interview process, and they go out to the farms, and they, they write up beautiful stories based on questions we have. And they write these stories on the blog. So here's Full Belly Farm that raises merino sheep and has, like, a, I don't know, 300 persons organic CSA in the Cape Bay Valley. We work with them as well, and we have 20 stories on the blog. If you want to read about who's on the land, you can just go read about them. So this is what's so important to me, is that we are looking at the system. What I've just described to you is I've basically shown you that we have galvanized designers and makers at a small scale so far in this presentation. We've shown you some garments. I haven't gone into rangeland carbon sinks yet. And we know little about composting, except that the clothes that we're making are compostable. I did mention that we need a $26 million wool mill to have really nice garments, but we are doing our best with what we've got. And we have brought indigo to the landscape, and we have a glut of raw fiber. 1.5 million pounds is just the wool. So, to further the conversation, we know that if we honor, this is where Marine Carbon Project worked, help involve with fiber shed really well. Dr. Marcia Delange, who did the life cycle assessment on compost applications for rangelands. How many of you know about the Marine Carbon Project? So it was a rangeland um, analysis bracketing all the soil types in California, apply a half inch layer of compost on the rangeland, see how much additional, compo additional carbon, not just the compost carbon, but how much additional carbon could you sequester by putting slow release fertilizers out onto the landscape, grazed landscapes. And so what they found was about 2,000 pounds of additional carbon, some of it a meter deep within four or five years. So that's about 500, so yeah, 2,000 pounds per hectare per year. The computer model showed 30 years of this happening, 26,000 liters of additional water holding capacity in the soils, everything you heard in the last presentation. We know we can sequester a lot of atmospheric carbon by igniting the state change in the rangelands. These are rangelands where sheep graze. So the same woman who did all the life cycle assessment at UC Berkeley, um, you know, offsetting the enteric fermentation of cows, the belching of sheep, all the stuff that everyone worries about, <laughs> we offset all of that and we looked at how we could create garments from these ascending spiral carbon sequestering rangelands. And what do these clothes look like from a carbon perspective? The far right is a 33 kilogram footprint. On the far right, you see that big orange bar. That's you buying pretty much a traditional Patagonia smart wool base layer. It's putting around 75 pounds of carbon into the atmosphere per shirt. Scale that to our current population. Then what Marcia did was she started to look at using a little bit of renewable energy. The next two bars are how do you start looking at using emissions reduction strategies in the supply chain. Okay, you start to see some improvements in the carbon footprint of the shirt. Now, when you go to the, the bar that's one, two, three, four, five, the fifth bar from the right, you start to see compost on the rangeland right there. You see amazing reductions there. You also see amazing reductions when you regionalize your employees and you take away commute times. When you put people in the landscape where they work, <laughs> amazing what that does for the carbon footprint. <laughs> and uh, renewable energy on the manufacturing system. So it's a combination of emissions elimination plus soil carbon, a very, um, what could we say, optimistic soil carbon credit. If the government would say, yes, you did get 2,000 pounds of CO2 per hectare per year. You know, if we could get all of that agreed upon, which we know from seven years of biogeochemical gas analysis is true, when you start honoring biogeochemical analysis, you put that compost on the landscape, your clothes start to sequester the same amount as the conventional garment was emitting. Your clothes become a carbon sink. So we looked at that and we thought, that is great. We can actually have the clothes be a living, breathing document of the land, and they can be a representation of our good land management. So we started to look at how we could scale this, and I started to bring all the wool I had, literally. I brought clumps of wool to a meeting with the North Face. 
And I said, this is what we have. <laughs> and it had lanolin, and it was greasy. We had some very awake designers who saw the LCA, and they saw the seven peer-reviewed papers from the carbon project. And they saw that there were a lot of other ways we were starting to talk about sequestering atmospheric carbon. Compost was just the starting point. You know, there's a lot more we can do, and we all know that. But they chose one clump of wool from a ranch in Modoc County, and they said, we'll buy this. First time a major brand of this scale has ever bought directly from a rancher. So they actually purchased wool from this ranch, and this is a ranch that is, this is not, these are not the land management practices that you go in and you go, great, we're already sequestering carbon, no. This is the opposite side of the land management spectrum. My friend and rangeland ecologist, Dr. Jeff Creek, and I went up there and we went, wow, they want to buy this wool and we have to make it carbon negative. Wow. <laughs> we can do this. It's been a slow but beautiful education process. I've even gotten a Trump bumper sticker as a gift. Um, <laughs> as <of last> week. <laughs> Which was so fun, I really didn't know what to do with it. Maybe I'll put it on the right side of my car and put Bernie Sanders on the left. <laughs> Um, this this is a ranch where the sheep um, produce, you know, it's, it's a lot of wool. We're talking above 40,000 pounds per year. So these big corporations are like, yeah, if you can help make that carbon negative, and that's the kind of scale of production we want to see. So we're, we're doing the research right now with this wool. Um, North Face's parent company is not the only company that will take this on. This is just initiating one thing. They bought the wool in May. They paid for the compost application. So the company is paying for the compost to now be made. We want to translate, what you see there are pivots. What you see is grass that's a little bit possibly too green because of nitrogen fertilizers. What we want to do is take away all use of nitrogen fertilizers, and the rancher's open to this, but he said, what are you going to do to nutrify the soil? We said, oh, we'll make compost. So what we're doing is we're using um, manure from the lambing barn. They do have some sacrifice pastures with a lot of manure collection. We're using all the on-site manure, spent hay, and some of the juniper chips that were being used for, a, a, I think it's a bioenergy plant far away. We've actually kept the juniper chips from Cal Fire. We've kept them close to the ranch, and so now we've added juniper chips, which the carbon-nitrogen ratio is 200 to 1. It's a lot of carbon. So the compost is slow to take, but we're, we're adding more uh, manure this week to raise our temperatures, adding a little bit of water. The sheep shearing happened um, in early May. This, this is the Ramboulet. And what we are so excited about is we bracketed California soil types when we did the marine carbon project research. Now we're looking at the semi-arid Great Basin, really. Modoc County and goes from the Warner Mountains into the Great Basin. So now we're looking at how does carbon farming work, compost applications work in the north northeast section of our state. So it's a really great question. And so this is a map of the home ranch. Down at the bottom is what we want to start with transforming. We want the compost on those nitrogen <laughs> fertilized pivots. So that's our first step, but we're developing an entire carbon farm plan based on, this is what we've come up with, NRCS practices that have already been known and well-loved since, you know, past the Dust Bowl. We know that uh, RCDs in California, the resource conservation districts, are quite strong in our area, and they are very interested in carbon farming. And so we're starting to roadmap all the carbon sequestration capabilities of all these practices. So it's not just the compost. The ranch in Modoc will end up having a whole litany of practices on their carbon farm plan, and we'll implement them as funding allows. And in California, we're looking through our Carbon Rich Healthy Soils Initiative that Governor Brown put out, a potential of 20 million this year that our resource conservation districts will be able to apply for grants for to apply not only compost but implement these practices on our landscapes. What will we need for our RCDs to be healthy and well to do this? We need carbon farm plans ready to go. So this is an early stage carbon farm plan that we're going to develop in MODOC and probably you'll see about 20 carbon farm plans by the end of 2016 just in Marin where we, our home base was, but um, we're working with about 17 RCDs across the state 
So what happened last week is one of the carbon farms that was part of our demonstration, Lauren Ponch's Sheep and Cattle Ranch, Stemple Creek, we just, he implemented the compost application last year, and then this year, last week, we got to um, put a whole corridor of native plants into an area that had slightly gullied. And the water was moving off the land very quickly. And he noticed the surrounding landscape was drying out. So this critical planting area in NRCS terms is called a riparian forest buffer. So last week, as part of the carbon, this is part of carbon farming. Putting, we got money through the Department of Conservation because of the, how these practices will are not known to sequester atmospheric carbon. So this is oak replantings, this is toyon, this is coffee berry, twin berry, and all of these plants we're hoping will start to slow spread and sink the water into this area. We had fourth graders um, from Point Blue Straw doing the work, and again all paid for by funding that's coming through our state now for carbon farming. And how do we know those other practices are sequestering carbon? We haven't refined this tool yet at all. It was originally created for industrial ag. How many of you know Comet Farm Planner? All fully calibrated for perennial systems. It hasn't been fully calibrated yet for a lot of the ag in California, but Keith Postian um, is working towards that end and has some funding to do so. So once you design a carbon farm plan, let's say the Modoc Ranch, we're gonna finish their carbon farm plan in November, end of November, end of this month. We take all the practices, and we know that Comet Farm is modeled for semi-arid soils, and we know the GPS of the ranch. We're gonna put in all the practices from the carbon farm plan into the Comet Farm planning tool, and it'll spit out an annual GHG number that's possible if we were to implement all those practices. And it gives you what will happen in kind of like year one. And as those plants mature, if you've got maturation as a part of your sequestration, it'll show you what happens in 20 years. And so it's a very, very conservative model. A lot of us in the room know that we can do, that what we're doing on the landscape probably is doing more than what the model is telling us. Here's an example of one of our demonstration sites, the Corda Winery. We're realizing that um, there's the, uh, average annual CO2 sequestration from their carbon farm plan, we know that around 408 is this, a million grams, a million grams, I don't know how to translate that for you all, um, of carbon, but we look at the 20 year rate, and you can see the 20 year rate, how much carbon would be sequestered. We are looking at the Marin demonstration sites and seeing that we're averaging about one and a half tons of carbon per acre on some of our rangelands with when we implement all these practices, which again is pretty conservative. But that one ranch, you know, the Corda Winery, which is also a ranch, um, 8,203 million grams is avoiding or offsetting the emissions of 1,727 passenger vehicles. That one winery and ranch doing some of, some of this work implemented, you know, we can see what we can do, and this is a very small landscape, so again, you saw this in the last presentation, but scaling the work, I think scaling the work is where we're at. How do we move quickly and rapidly to deploy what we already know works? That's really the question for me, because it took a couple years for us to get the funding to do that critical farm planting area. Took us a couple of years to get the funding for some of the compost. So why I look at climate beneficial wool, which is what cam is coming out of this Modoc ranch, is that we're going to actually say, here's the carbon farm plan. These are the expected elements of sequestration. Will the brands start to pay for some of these practices? How will the market engage? You pay for the compost. Are you interested in making that wool even more climate beneficial next year? Challenge the marketplace to make, make the impact of their wool more net carbon negative every year. Show them the carbon farm plan and show them how we can get there. So we're just working on a regional certification. Um, I don't think you know, it'll be something that I scale nationally. There are other certification bodies that can help with this. But this is how we've done it this year. We're gonna work, so in the MoDOT case, here's your carbon farm, um, here's your plan. We're gonna implement some one practice we're going to be able to certify the wool as part of this program we'll give it an initial footprint based on the one practice we know there's many other practices we need to pay for we enter the wool into the supply chain at a higher price 
By the way, the wool got double the price of its normal commodity market. The, the company was already incentivizing. Not only did they pay for the compost, they paid double for the wool. So can we also put more money into the finished price of the good? Can we start selling the goods for more and put at least 1% of that back into the regenerative fiber systems model and fund through a revolving fund how the market actually supports the sale of goods support more regeneration on the landscape? Again, how do we create positive feedback loops in the marketplace? And that would be, the, this graphic would describe that. You have a nonprofit carbon farm fund that actually is generated by the sale of climate beneficial goods. And it moves these materials through the marketplace. So that's what we're doing at home. And it's been um, about three years of work. Um, so we have a long way to go. And we have a lot more ranches and farms to incorporate in this work. But what I wanted to share with you is that there are now 28 national and international fiber shed communities. There are people across the land saying, what can I grow and what can I wear? And so we've started to work with some of these communities in different degrees. And I just wanted to show you that grass fed and row crop agriculture as it relates to your clothing, we're looking at also in the row crop landscape, what are other crops? Cotton is already in California, but what are other crops that are gonna move this along? We have seven plus, oh, what, almost eight billion? I don't know, a lot of people on this planet. We can't, you know, we can recycle natural fibers for a long time. We should have recycling systems. When they're not longer recyclable, we can compost them and renew the soils to grow more, more of the crops. But cotton, organic cotton, they've just found out, there was a study out of the UK about two weeks ago, organic cotton has a 90% lower water footprint than conventional cotton. Organic cotton has a 46% lower carbon footprint than conventional cotton. So cotton is not just cotton. So as you're looking at low-hanging fruits for your shopping, <laughs> go with organic cotton. It is a great climate strategy as an initial starting point. But we are also looking at the farm bill and how industrial hemp was just allocated in you know, a little two words by Mitch McConnell. You can grow industrial hemp now for research. And Kentucky lobbed onto that last year in 2014. So we think hemp is also going to be huge. Bast fibers, nettles. I love nettles. <laughs> I like to eat them, I like to wear them. <laughs> Um, they're a huge part of dressing human beings historically, um, as well as hemp fibers, as well as flax. These are food and fiber crops, and they are way more biomass dense on the landscape. You compress the impact of fiber systems when you increase biomass production on per, per acre amount. 500 pounds of cotton comes off of Sally Fox's biodynamic organic color grown cotton landscape. 500 pounds per acre. Hemp with a tenth of the water use of even Sally's organic cotton and all these other byproducts you can get from hemp is going to produce 2,000 pounds of wearable textile grade fiber. So we are interested in vast fibers and the evolution of this for our communities. So I'll just go into what that looks like. San Luis Valley, Colorado. We do have a hemp research project with a farm uh, that's known as the, Rezo, it's the Rezolana Institute at Adams State University. We planted a, a Russian variety of hemp that we imported by the skin of our teeth. The DEA held us up and created a landmark battle with our farmer. Um, we had mile high uh, bleached blonde hair in a Cadillac Escalade and a greased back. <laughs> like the most amazing look types came out of the DEA and their <laughs> Cadillac Escalade to Little Army's farm and threatened him to destroy his crop from last year. Um, he was delayed in planting. He had to plant in August. He had 30 days to grow his hemp this year. But we are looking forward to next year. We already have our seeds secured. We're gonna be planting in May because this is an incredibly frost tolerant plant and we discovered that this last winter where um, there was a 97% um, tolerance rate for the seedlings an inch out of the ground with a hard frost. So we know we can plant in May in the San Luis Valley. I mean, there are other things, electrical storms and things in this valley. Patrick, you're here. Speak up. <laughs> so 
Here is the hemp after 30 days. In 30 days of growing with one water, which is in this community, they do use a flood irrigation. They let out one, and they already said we didn't even need it this year because of the monsoon rains. We could have had this complete, basically rain-fed crop, and he, in 30 days, he got plants that were three and four feet tall. So imagine 90 days, 12 feet tall. These are in soils that are rotated. There was a cover crop last year, or last season, and Arnie's interested in roller crimpers. He's actually welded his own roller crimper. We, wanted, we did um, carbon baseline before Arnie planted. In all of these sites, we are looking at baseline carbon, and we're starting to look at how we can get that life cycle assessment we saw for wool. How can we get that LCA for hemp through no-till ag, cover cropping, so Arnie, this is Arnie, he loves old equipment, he's a great partner, he's going to be building all the equipment he needs to start this no-till experiment. Here's the hemp redding in the field from Colorado. It's short, but we're still going to decorticate it, meaning we're going to separate the woody parts from the raw fiber. Arnie made a brick last week. 30% of that brick is made out of hemp, the woody part that we don't need for the clothes. So he's looking into how we can look at tests for this um, and how we can look at how sturdy this thing is. He has a bunch of tests he wants to put out. We also got churro wool from this area. We decorticated some of the hemp, just we used the raw fiber just right off the plant, spun it with churro um, with some of my friends and hand spinners, and we created knit swatches using this uh, broad acre seeded plant and the grasslands, and together, that landscape brought forth these samples, and we're very excited about how to blend cellulose and protein fibers. Humans have always depended on this. Five minutes, okay. So we'll get, I'll close with Kentucky. We're working with the Wendell Berry Farming Program. I don't know if any of you know how exciting this is. <laughs> who was from Cal Poly who was worried about all of this pumping out of industrial agriculture? <laughs> This is the solution. <laughs> okay, so Wendell Berry Farming Program. I know it's like eight students he's graduating this year, but this is like first year. It's really exciting. So they grew hemp, and I'm working with them. I've gotten them into soil carbon, so now they're all testing for baseline <laughs> as best they can. We also grew on mountaintop removal sites in Kentucky. Appalachia is ingratiating the restoration economy. We consulted, we helped get the seed. Um, this is the mountaintop removal sites, 60 days after planting. Those are seventh and tenth generation Appalachian farmers who've also worked in the coal mines, who are really looking for an alternative. There's the hemp being dried and stored. We're combining the hemp with alpaca from Alvina Mater, who's a veteran who lives in um, just outside of these hemp field areas near the Wendell Berry Farming Program. We're working with Kathy Meyer, who's got wool, um, it's a Corydale Cross from Kentucky. We started to soften the hemp, and the bottom side, you can see these are the yarns we're starting to make by blending what Kentucky has, and we're calling it the Kentucky Cloth Project. We want to soften the hemp so it'll run through actual uh, wool mill equipment, which is going to take some enzymes and some other things, but you can use bacteria to ret the hemp in the field and then break it. This is a Thomas Jefferson design break. We had Patagonia money. I, I wrote a grant to Patagonia to help fund the veterans who grew this first crop in 2014 to build this break. And they were so excited that veterans said, you've made a doily farmer out of me. <laughs> <laughs> but I, and I, and I don't apologize. I'm so glad. And then the veterans had this idea, well, let's, we made hemp and you gave us the money for the break and we built the break. Let's process the material and make an American flag. So they started using natural dyes. I taught them about using indigo and madder root, and, and then the artisans in Kentucky, I met them, and we talked about how to do this project. We got the hemp hand spun. We, used, we did use Sally Fox's cotton from California for the warp, because you can see that hemp isn't quite ready to put on your loom as the warp. But it was the whole, basically the whole meat of the flag was this dew-redded, hand-broken, hand-spun hemp.
of questions on your left side. Thank you so much. Um, I'm actually a little bit hesitant to ask this question because I might be wearing a lot of poison right now. Um, but um, what, what a lot of the synthetic clothing I own markets itself as is hypoallergenic. And um, as you're talking about scaling this up, I'm wondering if you could address maybe some issues pertaining to allergies with you know, animal and plant-based crops for clothing. Okay, sure. Um, so hypoallergenic often means that, is this working okay? Yeah. Um, so I, I've looked at that just a little. I can't give you the most articulate answer, starting from the point that I personally never had um, allergic responses to anything I was wearing. I could, you know, pretty much shear a sheep and wear that coat and be okay. Um, so because of that, um, what I've looked into for synthetics is that I think it's a, what I'm seeing is it's a story. It's a ploy, it's a marketing story for the most part. With hypoallergenic, you're offering someone with heavy metals, endocrine disrupting agents, made of plastics with phthalates and BPA and BPB, and you're putting that on their body and you're telling them it's hypoallergenic. So that's maybe their easy way to say, I've created something dead and sterile and it has nothing on it. <laughs> um, so you're good. But, you know, the skin is the biggest organ. I know there's sensitivities. For wool, I'll just say this. We are looking at descaling wool at around 10% of the scales. A lot of what people feel is allergenic is that there's friction because you're wearing something that has realness to it, and there's a little bit of scale on the wool in particular. And so what we're doing is we're descaling it at 10% so you can put it next to your skin and it will actually feel like cotton. But you descale it with um, a new technology out of Littleton, Colorado. Um, we're using compressed CO2 air at 68 degrees temperature. And we've already done tests as of this, was two weeks ago, I got results back around how the descaling was occurring. And it's pretty amazing uh, the quality of the wool just by using this other new technology. And so I think we can get the wool to feel very, very soft. So the friction is what I think is more the allergenic, but you know there might be people in the room with exceptions and anecdotes to that. Yeah. What did the jeans cost? <laughs> <laughs> well, we when we internalized all of our costs for the research, which again this is a four-year project, and so um, they were six hundred dollars, <laughs> and we because we made twenty on a hand loan. And they were each pattern was custom made for that person. But then we also asked, because we live in the Bay Area, we were like, well, let's just add something to that. <laughs> let's add a donation to our organization when we charge for these of fourteen hundred. So we actually asked for two thousand dollars from some people who could afford that. We're mainly philanthropists who paid that, and now we're doing an economic analysis on how to actually scale the work using Draper looms, which are mechanical looms how to harvest indigo so I'm not out there with a hoary, hoary knife, which I like, but you know, we need to scale. And so what are the um, farm equipment items that we need? And then what are the value chain pieces we need? And so we, with that money we raised, we're actually doing this analysis in December to see how to scale them. And our goal is around $115 for a pair of jeans. Anybody on this side? Over here at the front. Who designed the blue sweater? Oh, the, the cashmere mohair? Yeah. Her name is Heidi Iverson, and you can get some of her work on our Fiber Shed Marketplace. We started a co-op, and some of the farmers and, and designers became such good friends that they've actually started these small businesses, and you can, you can support Heidi. Um, her new business is called HIJK. Yeah. Yeah, one more question over here. That's it. You're right. I actually have two questions. Decompress the little stuff. What is the possibility of treating it while you're at it to make it waterproof? The the wool? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, so wool starts waterproof and then we take that out of it, which is, you know, the lanolin uh, is what traditionally you would spin. In, you'd, they call it spinning in the grease. You spin the wool in the grease and um, that's how the British Isles were 
The men who went out fishing would wear these beautiful sweaters that were covered in lanolin, and the frozen Atlantic waters would come onto them. And they would be fine out there because the lanolin uh, shed the water. Now, what we're looking at is old school stuff, like how do you apply uh, beeswax back onto this? Like there used to be, um, a lot of you have seen Filson, you know, you can wear coats and such that have that wax put back on so we're not using fossil carbon based coating agents. So that's one thing to look at, but we haven't really gotten that far on do we keep the lanolin in, at what percentage do we keep it in, and how many external reapplications of other things are we going to put back on the wall. And some of these rain gear pieces, we don't wash them. The danger with wearing fossil carbon materials as undergarments is A, they have this like drinking water out of a hot plastic bottle. <laughs> you don't really want plastic right on the skin. But you also, um, these polypropylenes are things worn on the outside of the system. Those aren't washed. When we launder acrylic, it's when those plastic lint pieces get out into our waterway. And there's a lot of tech, like a lot of data on how we're shedding plastic lint into our biosphere when we wash this stuff. So I'm not averse at all to wearing the polypropylene. Just don't wash it and wear it as an outer layer and hand it down to your children so it never ends up in a landfill. Yeah. Next question was about the permitting for the hip. Hemp or where do you go to get your permits and stuff? What state are you in? Texas. Um, so Texas has, you know, you might want to look at your state level ag department policies and ask them if they have a caveat for you to apply with them to be under the Farm Bill research. And if you, if Texas does allow for you to do this research, then you would need the support of an accredited university and you could work with a local university or extension agent to import seed and work um, with them in collaboration. And that's how it works right now. 